Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I here am your host, Simon. And in this one, we're talking about the abduction of Kara Robinson, apparently, because if you're new here, what goes on is Callum has written me a script that I've never seen before. I have no idea about the abduction of Kara. Sometimes I know the stories because, I mean, they're super commonly known, but this one I don't know. I'm going to read it. I'm going to uh, add some commentary if I if I have anything to say. I usually do. We go off on some tangents. It's uh, kind of what we do here. And then Jen, afterwards, our fantastic producer, is going to uh, add some music, add some images if you're watching this. And uh, yeah, speaking of that if you're watching this on youtube hello there if you're listening on a podcast well also hello please do leave a review or a like that would be fantastic and let us just jump in shall we what would you do if you found yourself at the mercy of a serial killer (laughs) <laughs> straight up panic uh worry you know maybe maybe start praying convert to religion <laughs> the, the huge uh someone the other day was commenting i read the comments um obviously not all the comments on these videos on youtube but someone was like oh it's weird that simon's just totally happy to admit that if he saw some shit going down and he, he'd just be like nah i like life i'm not gonna get involved because i don't want to get murdered <laughs> and i was like ah oh, because people always talk a big game and it's like if i was captured by a serial killer it's like yeah what i would do is i'd use their knife against them and escape and it's like nah in reality i'd probably just panic and <laughs> try to hide every true crime fan has probably given it some thought at some point maybe some of you even have a plan of action ready to go just in case you ever find yourself in the trunk of the next bundy or gacy holy shit that's a dark thought that's all well and good but planning it in theory is one thing actually executing the plan is another it takes a certain kind of person and a certain amount of luck to stare a killer in the face and make it out with your life and i don't mind dropping a spoiler right now and tell you that that's the kind of story we're dealing with today amazing i'm pretty happy because i feel like the last few except for the one we did one about the dude who was always escaping from prison and that was like quite light-hearted and enjoyable i mean other than his crimes but uh i like it this sounds good it sounds like we're gonna have a happy ending today i mean obviously it's a serial killer so people are gonna have died beforehand but at least we can be happy that one person escaped and uh, maybe killed them. I don't know. That's what I'm hoping for. Let's carry on. In a brief detour from all the doom and gloom of murders and disappearances, in this episode we're following the miraculous escape of one young woman whose wits and bravery brought a heinous child killer to justice. Amazing. This is the story of the abduction and escape of Kara Robinson. And wait, is she a child? She's gonna be, it's a child bringing a serial killer to justice? I love it even more, let's go. The Kidnapping. It was a bright summer morning on the 24th of June, 2002, when 15 year old Kara Robinson, ah, oh, she's the same, that's the same age as me. 13, yeah, I was 15, May, June, yeah. Just about. Wow, that's cool. When 15-year-old Kara Robinson prepared for a day at the lake with her mates, the teenager, a native of Columbia, South Carolina, went around to her friend's place to collect her. Her friend told Kara that she needed a few more minutes to get ready, so the teenager offered to help out by watering the plants in the front garden for the girl's mother. Wow, that is a massively helpful teenager. (laughs) If I was at my mate's house just waiting for him to give him a lift, also, they're giving a lift? Can you drive at 15? Is that what's going on? Or maybe the parents are dropped. I don't know. Either way, if I went to my mate's house, I'm not going to be like, oh yeah, can I uh, water these plants for you? I'll just be like, I'm just going to sit in the car. (laughs) Uh oh, Simon. Little did she know as she grabbed the watering can and set about helping her friends with her chores that she was being watched. Not long after Kara was, and that's why you never help your friends. Not long after Kara was left alone in the front yard, a green Pontiac Firebird. I have no idea what that looks like, but it sounds cool. Uh, up at the end of the pulled up at the end of the driveway. The drive, although cars, I always found you know cars can have cool names, and then you look at them, and it's the most boring generic car you've ever seen. The driver, a middle-aged man with dark hair and goatee, called the teenager over. It's the classic, cliché, strange danger moment, practically lifted right out of those public safety videos that they show you in school. Kara was understandably reluctant to approach. She's also 15. And I understand there's like a big, you know, there can be a 15-year-old who's super mature and capable of dealing with intense situations and then there could be 15 year olds like simon at 15 and be like way <laughs> unable to deal with anything 
Um, and still today. But there was no reason to worry. The guy was just an innocent magazine salesman. Oh, okay. He stepped. No, he's not, is he? That's his. That's his game. He stepped out of the car, smiling and waving his samples. Come take a look. It'll only take a second. A second was all he needed. Kara walked over to the car where the man stood next to him. Who's selling magazines out of a, out of a car? Just driving around selling magazines. I'd be like, you seem like a pedophile. She walked over to the car, stood next to the open driver's side door. As soon as she got within arm's reach, she bent down into the vehicle and produced a handgun from beside the seat, pressing the cold steel of the muzzle into her neck. Kara later told the papers, I think I felt a moment of terror, but I knew I just needed to do what he told me to do. That meant climbing into the back seat of the car and into a 50 gallon plastic container the kidnapper had waiting there. Oh my god. <laughs> this is some movie scary shit right now. It's like, why am I in a plastic container? Is it gonna get messy? <laughs> That's not a good thing. In a state of shock and pure adrenaline, she quietly complied. Seconds later, she was sealed inside the cramped container. Oh, holy shit cramped container and the only sounds the beating of her own heart and the car peeling out of the street a couple of minutes more and Kara's friend stepped onto the front lawn with no idea of what had happened to her now I know you're probably thinking that you know how the story goes it usually goes quite poorly to say the least I mean what matches a 15 year old kid for a grown man with a gun but I already told you that that's not the route we're going down today this was no ordinary 15 year old girl this was Kara Robinson Bane of child snatch slayer of sex offenders the first of her name and absolute legends i'm excited for what's going to happen in her our creepy old kidnapper had more than met his match gather information wait escape the first and most crucial survival tip tip that we can learn from kara is this play to your strengths by that i mean as she was huddled there inside that stuffy plastic box she knew the odds of her smashing out and knocking her kidnapper out with a haymaker were well limited so if force isn't an option you might have to play the long game which for her in that moment meant collecting as much information as possible about her situation from the moment the car left her friend's street but the rest of that day she lived by a simple motto gather information wait for him to be complacent escape she said that was just rolling through my brain constantly she began small with the serial number of the box she was trapped in oh my god this girl is amazing <laughs> if i was trapped in this box as an adult man i'd be like i'm fucked i'm fucked i'm fucked i'm fucked i'm fucked i'm fucked <laughs> and that would be the end of the story i'd be like look at her serial numbers and shit. <laughs> oh my god i'm not james bond i'm just gonna die and be buried in a shallow grave it was impossible to tell how long she was trapped inside, but I bet the numbers on that box are still burned into her brain today. That's how intensely she studied them. For over an hour, she focused on the numbers, repeating them over and over again until they were etched into her brain. That repetitive meditation was broken when a plastic cage rocked suddenly forward and she heard the sound of the handbrake being set. They had arrived as the teenager steeled herself for whatever was about to come. Did she memorize those numbers so that later on she can use as evidence when she's escaped and is telling the police and they identify the plastic box? <laughs> I can't get over quite how impressive that is. The car door opened and she felt herself being heaved into the air, then carried across the driveway and dumped onto the floor with a thud. When the lid was hauled off, she saw that the same man from earlier was staring down at her with a very different kind of smile on his face. Do everything you're told and I won't have to hurt you, he told the teenager as she climbed out of the box, finding herself in a dingy little ground floor apartment. Knowing she didn't have any other options, she agreed, but as she stepped out of the box, she picked up on a few more details to help her secret rebellion. Magnets on the fridge with the name of a local dentist, a couple of little rodents in cages in the living room. <laughs> weird oh, i guess like rodents can include hamsters and stuff right and i mean i think it's weird people have hamsters as pets because they're smelly little nasty creatures but i mean it's not that unusual to have a hamster although one thing i'd be thinking if i was this girl i wouldn't be memorizing serial numbers or being a hero or anything like that is like well this dude's definitely gonna hurt me because i've seen his face and that means i'm not gonna be let go voluntarily because i've seen movies so at some point i've got to do something I'm just gonna bide my time I, but I wouldn't be doing it as competently as she is. And I'd still be panicking massively. 
Quote, I had to get as much information about this person and my surroundings as I can so that I can escape and I can identify this person when I do escape. Her legs had gone numb, making those first few steps difficult, but she managed to make it over to the living room sofa. There, her captor fastened on a pair of blue fluffy handcuffs reinforced with copper wire that cut into her skin. Then he bound her legs and set her down in front of the TV. For the first time, Kara got a chance to probably study the man who abducted her. A white guy, about 40 years old, brown eyes, heavy set, dark brown hair with a dusting of grey, double chin. After a few minutes of absorbing the details, she'd be able to pick him out of a crowd of 10,000. The man then stood up and turned on the TV, switching it over to the evening news. He forced Kara to watch, checking in if her abduction had made it into the news cycle. That seems like a mistake. Should you really be letting your captive person know whether they've been, the police have been alerted and stuff? I mean, I don't know what they're going to do with that information, but it doesn't sound like smart. But, you know, <laughs> we're rarely accusing us. Their serial killers always think they're very smart, but it's rarely an accusation we'll throw their way. Nothing. Nobody's coming to get you, he told her. Now, as for what happened next, there's no real need for me to go into any detail. After all, this isn't a story of sympathetic creeps depravities. It's the story of how he got what was coming to him. Hell yes. Instead, let's focus on the state of mind Kara got herself in, which helped her stay composed no matter what. Quote, in that apartment, I knew what this man's intentions were for me while I was being assaulted. I strong-willed myself into remaining as calm as I could as long as I could. I remember at one point there was a gun within my reach, and I thought for a moment about grabbing the gun, and then I realized there was little chance that I was going to win that fight. But you got a gun, though. Just shoot him super quick. Just pop, pop. But then, I mean, the problem is, like, I don't know how to use a gun. I mean, I do. But it's like, what if it's a gun that I don't know how to use? What if it has a safety catch? I don't know where the safety catch on the, gu on the gun is. Is the gun loaded? If it's not, you're screwed. Still playing the long game. So our list of survival tips currently stands at play to your strengths, gather information, and pick your moment wisely. Sure, it's cool to go for the Hail Mary and die for that pistol on the kitchen counter, but are you really willing to risk it all on one play? No, don't be daft. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I would seriously consider it because you never know things could be a lot worse a moment in a moment and this might be your one opportunity and then you'd look back and it'd be like damn but also complacency is I guess the ho she's hoping for complacency and then making a better move instead be like Kara she just kept to her strategy and gathered every little bit of intel that she could the distinctive paintings on the walls a hairbrush in the bathroom with long strands of red hair tangled up in it each little detail told her more about the kind of man she was dealing with as the ordeal unfolded over the rest of that day she observed not only the apartment itself but the man inside it. She realized that if she played into the role that he expected her to fulfill, then she might be able to curry favor and win some privileges. After the assault ended, the kidnapper started acting bizarrely normal, playing house, as Kara put it. He wiped the kitchen counters, vacuumed, and washed the dishes. Sensing an opportunity, she was asked if she could sweep the floor, trying to appease him. In a sense, it worked, and she was freed from her restraints and allowed to work without a pair of cuffs on her wrists. This girl is so smart. <laughs> She's 15. She's definitely one of those like mature 15-year-olds. She's not Simon mature 15. <laughs> Big difference. But her captor's watchful eye stayed on her at every second, especially when she drifted even slightly towards the front door. It wasn't quite time to make a run for it, but she did manage to register that it was both locked and bolted. She wouldn't be able to unlock it in time before he was on to her. So Kara's obedient act continued for the rest of the evening until she was forced to lie down in bed next to this uh, next to this contemptible creep. Her short-lived freedom from restraints had come to an end, and to make matters worse, her legs and cuffs were bound to the bed frame with rope. However, she noticed one last crucial detail, the most important one of all. I was in handcuffs, but they had a fuzzy ring around them, so that provided enough slack that one of them was not that tight. This was her chance. Ooh, cool. This isn't going to be over soon, though, because we've got so many pages left to go. Um, uh, oh god, or, or are we just going to go through this guy's horrible crimes once he's captured for the rest of the episode? Callum, no, don't do it to me. I mean, everyone's like, I hope so. I hope we do that, Simon. I just don't want it. I just want to hear about her killing him. I mean, or kicking his ass or something cool. I kind of hope she kills him. Is that bad? No, it's not bad. He seems like a terrible person. Now, just before we continue with today's video, it's time for me to tell you about today's glorious sponsor, HelloFresh. Yes! 
fall in love with fall. It doesn't quite have the same ring in uh, British English. Fall in love with autumn. But fall in love with fall is very clever. Indulge in fall's bounty with HelloFresh's seasonal selection of savory size and autumn-themed desserts. That sounds good. I have to say, fall or autumn is like one of my favorite times of the year. Summer's too hot, winter's too cold, and after like the hot heat of summer, it's nice to go into autumn and like wear a jacket, eat soup, that kind of, you know, autumny stuff that is nice before the bleak, bleak winter. With HelloFresh, you choose from an ever growing new rotation of weekly recipes featuring hearty soups, what was I just talking about, chilies, and in season four produce to take advantage of the season's fresh flavors. Yeah, that also, I'm super hungry right now. I'd really go for some chili. I mean, rather nice. HelloFresh's recipes are delicious. Yeah, that's no joke. They've got more five-star reviews than any other meal kit, so you know you're gonna get something delicious. Also, depending on what sort of person you are, like what sort of diet you lead, they've got lots of different options. Family friendly, calorie smart, pescatarian, and veggie options every week. And they don't mention it there, but uh, if you're just a regular meat-eating human being, they can absolutely handle that as well. I mean, they got chili on there. That's a good thing. It's all very delicious stuff. And basically, the big idea is it saves you time and it saves you effort. For me, I rather like cooking, so I've never really had a problem with, like, you know, getting all the ingredients together and doing that stuff. But what drives me insane is going to the store and being like, well, I wanted this chicken, but they don't have that. And I wanted that spice in it, so they don't have that either. And that thing doesn't look very fresh. With HelloFresh, it's all fresh. It arrives in a cool box at your door. Everything's pre-portioned in, like, the right sizes, so you just mix it together. And it cuts out the grocery store, which is a hell of a selling point in my opinion so oh my god does the is that true the average trip to the grocery store takes 41 minutes that's actually crazy and also sustainability everything's pre-proportioned so you don't waste any food which is very nice because i don't know whenever i cook like and you know you're just buying all like i need like one spoon of garlic powder it's like well you got to buy this giant box of garlic powder and it's like oh well Actually, garlic powder is a bad example because I use garlic powder all the time. But like, you know, you buy one spice and you just need it and then you never use it again. It's wasteful. HelloFresh is just a better way of doing it. And on the screen now, you are seeing some beautiful examples of food that was not cooked by me because I can't get HelloFresh where I am, which is to my constant deep sadness. But I have my uh, American counterpart get those things, try them out. And he's always like, dude, it's so good. It's so good. I'm so sad that you can't have it, but also grateful that I get it instead of you. Go to HelloFresh.com, use the code CRIMINALIST14 to get 14 free meals, including free shipping. 14 free meals, code CRIMINALIST14 at HelloFresh.com. That's fantastic. And now, the rest of today's video. The Escape Lesson number four. When the opportunity for escape arises, take your time. Don't blow it all by striking before the iron is hot. That's why Kara pretended to fall asleep herself, waiting until she was sure the man next to her had actually drifted off. She closed her eyes and tuned her ears. A few hours of tense waiting and she heard the starting pistol that she was waiting for. The man was snoring. After taking a few more moments to confirm he was really asleep, Kara pulled her thumb into her palm and started slowly working her hand out of the loose side of the cuffs. Once one hand was free, she could then carefully lean forward and untie her legs. What about the other hand, though? Unless you got the key to the handcuffs, what are you going to do about that other hand? Oh, wait, or are the handcuffs not actually attached to anything? Is it just one hand is attached to the other? Okay. Then this is an excellent plan. Go, go, go. The sun was beginning to rise as she shuffled to the edge of the bed, watching the rising and falling of the man's chest for any sign of disturbance. She hadn't heard a thing, so she crept over the bedroom floor and slowly opened the hallway door. One creak from the floorboard of hinges, and it was all over. Oh my god, yeah, but this is everything in houses makes noise. I'm like, uh, my wife and I, we've got two super young kids. I mean, one's like nearly two and one's a baby. And it's always like, if I go to pee in the night, the baby's asleep in the other room, or the kids are sleeping in the other room, I was like, oh, God, God damn it, door handle, why? <laughs> why? And because then waking up the kid, it's like, oh no, no I gotta put you to bed, and it's three o'clock in the morning. My kid was up for like two and a half hours last night. I'm not even feeling like normal. I, I feel like this casual criminal is a bit more sedate because I'm so tired. Ah, <laughs> yeah, except why am I complaining? It's like, Simon, you realize you're complaining about your like wonderful children waking them up in the night when this woman's trying to, this girl's trying to escape from a serial killer sex offender. Like, yeah, oh my God, my problems are so small. <laughs>
She managed to move down the dimly lit hallway and now stood facing the front door of her suburban prison. This was my moment to escape. A metal shutter was rolled over the entrance, which had to be shifted to the side with a loud scrape. Before she could turn the lock, slide back the deadbolt and dart it out. I just ran. I didn't look back for a second. Yes, the last pro, pro tip, when the moment to escape finally comes, grab the bull by the goddamn horns without a second thought. That's exact, exactly what she did, and 18 hours after a brutal ordeal began, Kara Robinson was breathing freely again. She never stopped to enjoy the feeling, sprinting out to the edge of the apartment complex's parking lot, where she found two good Samaritans sitting in a car. Breathless, with a pair of handcuffs still hanging off her wrist, she pleaded with them to take her to the closest police station. I know every parent tells their kid, don't get into to cars with strange men this is a goddamn exception like can you although can you imagine what the chances of these two people it's like they're also just happen to be sex offenders and she just gets into their car it's extremely small in this situation i'm happy to say it get into the car of the stranger and they, and, and just trust them to take you to the police station <laughs> Only in movies do they turn out to be in cahoots with the serial killer. But given the circumstances, I think we'll give Kara a free pass here. This is epic. Minutes later, our intrepid escapee was sitting in front of an officer from the Columbia Police Department. I'm assuming... Col Wait, where is this taking place? <laughs> I just assumed this was America the whole time. And her name's Kara Robinson. Columbia, South Carolina. Okay, so we haven't suddenly taken a trip south of the border. Detailing the nightmare that she'd just been through. It took a little while to piece together a clear picture of exactly who she was and what she was claiming. However, the girl herself was amazingly clear-sighted for someone who had just suffered hours of abuse. One of the interviewing officers later said, She was so, so alert. She was able to give us information down to the exactness of what was in the apartment. This was all that careful observation paying off. Kara routed off every detail about the man's appearance, his car, his belongings. She even knew... The name of the man's dentist for christ's sake of course the most important part was his home address rolling back through her memories she was able to lead officers to the very same door that she had burst through just a short while before but of course by this point her attacker had realized his mistake his victim had slipped through his fingers and he was long gone yeah yeah but the manhunt begins and uh, we all know how the manhunts end you are getting caught because you're a, like the police you know we sometimes make fun of the police and like sometimes they're not super competent but when it's a child abducting serial killer and you have his address and you know his name oh boy <laughs> maybe the fbi comes in and does some serious like police shit. he's gonna get caught the kidnapper so who, I wonder, was the man that kidnapped Kara from her friend's garden on that day back in 2002? The police were able to glean a name from his place of residence, which was confirmed after Kara picked him out of a photo lineup. His name was Richard Ivonitz, a 38-year-old Navy veteran and South Carolina native. Oh, so your thumbprints, fingerprints are going to be in the database because you're a veteran and all of this stuff. Oh. And I mean, she's picking him out in a lineup. So, spoiler alert, he gets caught. I do wonder what's happening for the rest of this episode because there's a lot of pages left our creepy magazine man now had a name and a license plate number to go with it both of which were broadcast to law enforcement around the area hopefully they would be able to catch him in their net before he was gone for good in the meantime the richland county police were tasked with finding out who exactly they were dealing with they soon discovered that this pathetic reprobate was almost completely unnoteworthy what a surprise seriously if it weren't for the whole child predator thing you'd struggle to find much to say about him friends and family described him as a completely normal guy twice married a good worker who was awarded the navy good conduct medal twice and was well enough liked among his current colleagues at an air compressor factory sounds like the most generic dude ever nothing good nothing bad just a dude i mean working at an air compressor factory almost sounds like a made-up job that a spy would choose uh richland county sheriff leon lott said at the time quote what we've been able to and there were no signals no signs he was someone who just blends in yeah this is the thing like it would be so crazy like or i don't really know anyone there's no one i know who i'm like that dude's a bit weird like if he turned out to be a serial killer i wouldn't be surprised um but all of my friends seem totally normal and it would be a massive shock it would be a massive unbelievable shock if one of them turned out to be a serial killer or something i'd be like holy sh dude <laughs> that's wild i mean wild in a bad way and now i feel really uncomfortable that you were my friend for so long <laughs> i'm not coming to visit you in prison you freak <laughs> we're terrible friends nah i think that's okay if your friend turns out like if your friend turns out to be a robber or something then it's like oh, okay i mean it's about i don't know if they're like a violent robber 
Is that different? I don't know where I'll draw the line, but serial killer, child predator. Yeah, no, that is definitely below that line. Below the line being the bad side, where it's like, no, we're not friends anymore. <laughs> you weirdo. Now, as a brief aside, I'd just like to chip in that I personally would 100% call the police if I saw someone that looked like Evanitz within 500 feet of a school. Oh no, what does he look like? Let's look him up. Jen, put a picture on the screen. Uh, I mean... Hang on, I'm not sure he... Oh no, there's this some pretty creepy looking photos. I mean, if he was hanging around in a creepy way near a school, then I'd be like, all right, that guy's a weirdo. But he doesn't give off those, like, you know, classic pedophile vibes. <laughs> Can't believe I just said the words classic pedophile vibes. Well, let's move on. Maybe it's the power of hindsight, but his pictures certainly aren't giving off reliable babysitter vibes. No, no, no. But they're also not giving off the classic pedophile vibes either. You know, the big glasses. <laughs> The, I don't know, there's just that pedophile look, isn't there? It's like, classic pedophile look. Regardless of what I think, on on the outside, it appeared that Evanitz lived a completely normal life in that little apartment alongside his much younger wife and elderly mother. Wait, where were they? Where's he getting up to all this serial killing business? The two ladies of the house were on vacation to Walt Disney World together when Evanitz kidnapped the teenager and brought her to the apartment. Wait, his wife and elderly mother went off to Disney World together? That's a weird trip. I'd find it weird if I went off to, like, Disney World with my wife's mother. Be like, what are we up to? Why are we going on holiday together? I mean, I get on with her. I like her, but it would just be a weird trip. <laughs> I'd be like, what are you getting up to home? Who to at home, wife? You better not be kidnapping girls again. I say, I, I don't know why I said again then. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it sound like my wife's a criminal. As far as I know, she's not. I'll be alarmed to find out if she was, though. The two... <laughs> what am I talking about? I don't know. In fact, the green Pontiac he used to kidnap the child actually belonged to his mother. That's the surface-level analysis of Evidence's character, but as the police began to pick apart his life, they discovered that there was a very different man hiding behind this completely nondescript mask. Back in 1987, when he was 24 years old, Evidence was caught up in a little public masturbation incident. Happens to all of us, Callum writes in brackets. Just to, just to be absolutely clear there, uh, we're, we're, we're going to assume that sarcasm. But... He was. Th this was no ordinary, wholesome public masturbation incident. No, not at all. While on leave in Florida, Evanitz went down to the town of Orange Park and exposed himself to a 15-year-old girl and her infant sister as they walked down the street. What are you up to? The girl was able to give a description to the police, and they soon identified him as the one responsible. Dude, what are you up to? That's weird. So, when the future kidnapper's ship pulled back into port, the cops were waiting to arrest him. You have to wonder, if a guy like that can leave the Navy with two good conduct medals, are they not handing them out a bit too liberally? I mean, how low is the bar for good conduct exactly? I Also, I mean, his conduct in that, like, are they, uh, is this criminal? The Navy, I feel like, would check for criminal records. Sh no. <laughs> I feel like that would be something they're aware of. But maybe it just says, like, public masturbation and not the like specific or like sexual offenses thing and not like the actual nature of the crime exactly but then also like years later in the navy and whatever he's gets i can't i don't feel like those two are related so much he can get his good conduct medal in the medal in the navy it's all part of that mask that he's made for himself i'm not defending him i'm just saying they're different maybe they just never had one that said good job becoming a registered sex offender <laughs> that's exactly what he was down in florida however when he spent his time in post-service life hopping between various states and ultimately returning to his native south carolina he never bothered registering his criminal status in any other states i mean isn't it weird that he's the one who has to register it? It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm a sex offender. And you go to a new state, you got to be like, hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm here to register. Oh, are you registering for a, like, uh, I don't know, garbage pickup? Other things people register when they move to a new state or city? But it's like, no, no, no. no I'm here to register my sex offenses. It'd be like, why? I guess because it's a legal requirement. Also, I, I don't know if this is true, but can you be on the, like, the sex offenders register for, like, peeing in public? <laughs> Because I'm always wondering about that. Because I don't know, I don't have the biggest bladder in the world. And often be like, oh, i got to take a slash. And it's just like, yeah, yeah, I'll pop into that bush. Keep an eye out, wife. But I'm like, if a child walks past, am I going to get on the sex offenders register because I really need it to be? I guess not. I assume that's something that's actually, like, not really real. And, I mean, definitely 
probably an american thing which as you might imagine is a bit of a problem wait what's the problem i lost my place i was talking about peeing oh he never registered his sex offender status so that's a bit of a problem especially when the offender himself candidly admits that it wasn't a one-off thing oh <laughs> brilliant well done court documents reveal suspect stated that he had a problem with masturbating in front of girls when he feels the urge he drives around looking for a girl 18 to 19 years old and short in height and has brunette hair dude you need to be on some sort of list well i mean you are on some sort of list the sex offenders register but you need to be on some sort of like turbo sex offenders list where it's not people peeing or like i don't know just doing regular masturbation in public but if you're like if you're admitting that you're driving around looking for people to whack off in front of mate <laughs> you need to be on the turbo sex offenders list people need to be watching you that's the sort of guy you should really be keeping better track of agreed callum 100 percent agree but unfortunately evidence was allowed to slip through the cracks afterwards it appears as if he then evolved his methods from indecent exposure to outright assault in his apartment where several stashes of guns and ropes kits put together for the sole purpose of kidnapping young women clearly this man was methodical it was very unlikely that cara was his first victim and had she not escaped perhaps another neighborhood girl would have been next hidden in a footlocker in the kevin Abba's bedroom the cops found something absolutely horrifying oh god it's gonna be like trophies or some weird shit, isn't it a series of handwritten notes describing the appearance and addresses of various girls in the area he had been stalking young girls for months maybe even years and collecting data about their suitability as victims i mean i have to say i expected it to be like oh he collected their molars and it's then it's like oh shit. Whereas this is like actually better than what I imagine, which pretty much never happens in Casual Criminalist. Estimated ages, routines, addresses, physical descriptions. It must have been made. It must have made for some pretty skin-crawling reading, especially for the parents of the girls featured. Oh my god, just don't read that. If if one of your if you found out that your kid was on this serial killer's like potential hit list, I'd be like, and they're still alive, and not kidnapped. I'd be like, no. They'd be like, do you want to read it? I'd be like no absolutely not get it out of here please no judging by these snippets it appears as if he was honing in on one girl in particular over in over in neighboring lexington county one of the detectives of the case revealed he described her her house the garage everything he was very organized i have no doubt he was a serial killer before they could confirm their hunch they needed oh my god i'm like today i'm ordering some apple ear to air tags and i'm sewing them into the ch the clothes of my children <laughs> oh my god this is so f***ed up he was very organized i had no doubt he was a serial killer before they could confirm that hunch they needed to confirm some other victims naturally that started with the girl over in lexington county sending officers to her house and checking the database of missing people thankfully that anonymous girl was still safe and sound and as and she told a local paper it's kind of scary that some guy was out there looking at me i want to know why he didn't get me just be grateful just be grateful and hope that he stays in prison forever or maybe gets killed we can hope for that i guess it's america there's always the option of the death penalty i mean where was this again south carolina that feels like one of those states where they're a bit yeehaw right they could they could be getting on that death penalty like i feel like you know there's certain states where you're like you're pretty sure like alabama texas they're gonna have the death penalty i feel like south carolina's around there isn't it in that like in that death penalty zone like in the south south carolina in the south i have no idea i'm sorry if you're from south carolina i mean no offense by it in this case i'm quite glad you have the death penalty to be honest if you do i don't know if you do <laughs> things people re rarely google does south carolina have the death penalty oh wait it's actually the third most popular thing googled after state income tax mask mandate <laughs> and it's the death penalty apparently people google it all the time oh my god by firing squad or electric chair holy south carolina what is this the 1950s you are all yeehaw and where are you compared to texas let's not look up images of the dat let's just search south carolina oh no you're way far away from texas you're like above florida you're in the east coast i like your state flag though i guess there isn't any reasonable answer to that question what question oh why that girl didn't get kidnapped uh it was just blind luck that he botched uh, another crime before he could move on to her meaning she dodged having to ever meet him however the same copy said for every other girl that evidence set his eyes upon deeper down in that footlocker of despair were a set of older notes on oh, no, a scribbled in messy handwriting probably as evidence was parked on the street watching his potential victims walk home from school tucked in among these notes were a pile of newspaper clippings concerning the kidnapping and murder of three girls from spotsylvania county virginia back in the 1990s oh shit. 
all of them taken in broad daylight just like kara all of them found shortly after in bodies of water it was only then that it at home for kara just how close to death door she really was that night yeah i mean also you saw his face you know you're gonna get killed the virginia murders so this is where the story really gets interesting okay i mean this is already super interesting this is one of my favorite ones in a while not only had kara escaped her tormentor and saved her own life she had inadvertently lifted the mask off one of south carolina's worst child predators of the decade here's how the connections were drawn among the depraved prowlers notes was the name of a street blockhouse road spotsylvania county virginia about seven hours north of columbia south carolina that by itself doesn't mean much but underneath were the descriptions of five unnamed girls all young teens who lived around that area and more worryingly richard evidence lived in that area for a while as well he actually would be a bit weird if he didn't i mean i think we all knew what we what was coming he actually established himself in virginia with his first wife in the 1990s and only moved back to south carolina a few years before when that marriage fell apart and the bank foreclosed on his house clearly had been stalking the suburbs of virginia throughout his 30s as well searching for likely victims and tragically it appears that he found some among the notes were newspaper clippings about the disappearance of a pair of sisters who lived on blockhouse road oh oh another tip here for criminals if you've committed a crime and it's reported in the paper don't clip it out of the paper and keep it that's a bad idea obviously if you want to have a souvenir <laughs> i don't even know why we're saying this because don't give tips to criminals but don't make it that some don't, don't make it newspaper clippings of the crime that's way too specific what the hell when the investigators down in south carolina called the center for missing children they confirmed that these two young girls had in fact gone missing from the exact street that he had been watching five years prior their names were Kristen and catty lisk two sisters just 15 and 12 years old you had to kidnap two people from the same family didn't you you dickhead. i mean it's bad enough to kidnap two individual children from like two separate families but it's somehow worse to like take two from the same family it's like when they used to send people off to war like isn't that the whole thing what band of brothers was about where it's like that they they'd always like if all of the children of, of one family had been killed then they wouldn't send the last one to war because they don't want all the kids to die yeah so uh god damn you the list sisters went missing from their own front yard on the 1st of may 1997 not long after arriving home from school a five-day search for the girls ended in tragedy when their bodies were found in the south anna river in hanover county about 40 miles south from their home testing revealed that they had bath water in their lungs meaning that they were taken to someone's home between the abduction and the river curiously the circumstances of their death bore a striking resemblance to another crime from the september before from the exact same county yep those are related you've got a serial killer hello which was especially strange because the cops were absolutely certain they'd already caught the guy who did that one. Oh man what is what has happened here the crime i'm referring to was the kidnapping of 16 year old sophia silver who went missing from her doorstep on september the 9th 1996. that afternoon sophia sat on the front doorstep doing her homework but when her older sister came to check on her she found only her notes and a can of soda left at first Spotsylvania sheriff howard smith treated sophia as a runaway which ran directly counter to the family's description of a happy carefree teenage girl missing posters were distributed around the county for a five foot five inch girl with purple nail polish on her finger and toenails yeah i feel hang on if you go to the police can't we assume she's been kidnapped rather than run away just for that first i don't know what is it like the first few days they're like super critical or the first few hours or whatever how about we just assume she's kidnapped and use some resources for that because i can't possibly think of anything more important for the police to be doing and then like later be like oh maybe she ran away but how about we just assume the worst at the beginning police come on of course this brought a wave of sightings from all over the place sophia was allegedly sighted as far away as a casino in las vegas apparently she was so sick of her homework she decided to quit school and become a blank jack hustler the usual cast of parasites and miscreants crawled out of the woodwork too with dozens of so-called psychics reporting visions of the girl's whereabouts so oh, just stop wasting the police's time please you're just a charlatan or in some cases the whereabouts of her remains tragically the latter would prove to be more accurate just over a month after she disappeared 
Sophia Silva's body was found abandoned in a swamp wrapped up in a blue blanket. As the cops cast their net around the area, the first people they focused on were, naturally, the registered sex offenders. That's how they found themselves on the doorstep of a 44-year-old man named Carl Michael Roche. He lived just four houses down from Sophia Silver and boasted convictions for indecent exposure, trespassing, and some 18th century Virginia law for visiting a bawdy place. I'll let you speculate on just how bawdy we're talking here. Wait, bawdy? I'm not even exactly sure what it means, but that would, would that mean he's like, gone off to a brothel or something? <laughs> Also, why is this law still on the book and written like that? It's kind of weird that people are, don't know what it is. But it's, yeah, I, you can look up where sex offenders, I don't know if you can do that here, where I, I live in Prague in the Czech Republic. I'm not sure if you can do that here, and I'd also be a little bit afraid. I also live in a city, so it's very densely populated. I'm sure there's like lots of sex offenders around, which is kind of terrifying. But I know in the US you can look it up on a map. There was a, God, what podcast was I listening to? Well, they played a game and they looked up the, it was like, who lives next to the nearest, the most registered sex offenders? I was like, oh my God, it's so dark. And there were many. Forensic testing of Roche's van. I don't know why that's funny. Why am I laughing at this? It's just horrible. Stop being sex offenders, people. What's wrong with you? Forensic testing of Roche's van revealed some blue fibers which appeared to match the blanket around the victim, as well as some pieces of hair and a fleck of purple paint. You've got him, the lab tech declared to the sheriff when he called him with the results. Not only that, the girl's family reported that the local sex offender had tried to talk to the girl in the past as she walked past the house after school, which is about as red of a flag as you could possibly get. All of this was enough to have Roche arrested and charged with the girl's death, which is precisely why the later discovery of the Lisk sisters threw such a spanner into the works for Sheriff Smith. Yeah. Ah, man, this is so... Ugh like the register local sex offender it's like saying like the local drunk or the local policeman or the local postman or whatever i don't know why i threw drunk in there but it's like you know you get these local characters yeah it's the local sex offender it's it's jeff hey jeff how you doing done any sex crimes lately it's like it's just weird I don't like the fact that there are sex offenders. Not only did the good sheriff have another two murder cases on his hands, the one he just solved was thrown wide open again. There were certain details of the three murders, most significantly the fact that the intimate parts of the bodies had been shaved, dude, which strongly suggested they were linked, clearly impossible, with the bawdy public masturbator Roche behind bars. So the cops went back and reviewed the lab work which put him there. Sure enough, the overconfident forensic tech had actually botched some of the testing, meaning he was this close to sending an innocent man to jail for murder. Oh man, this is crazy. Like, that is. I mean, yeah, he's a sex offender and all of this stuff, but if he hasn't killed anyone, he doesn't go deserve to go to prison for killing someone. Um, which that's a pretty intense mistake to make. Think about it. The case against Roche was devastatingly clear, so if the real killer had just avoided killing again, he'd essentially have committed the perfect crime. But as things stood, Roche was released, and the hunt for a new Virginian serial killer was set to begin. Sheriff Smith oversaw the DNA matching of over 400,000 convicted felons from up and down the East Coast, and thousands of leads were investigated. A $150,000 reward and a feature on America's Most Wanted brought the tips pouring in by the bucket load. But despite all of that, the years wore on with no results. Until, as you already know, the same psychopath who killed those girls up in Virginia got sloppy. His next confirmed victim would prove to be more than he could handle, and now he was a wanted fugitive with the police hot on his heels. At last, let's lock him up. At this point, it was all but confirmed that he was the killer in the Lisk Sylvia Silver cases. The cops had the notes, the souvenirs, and the knowledge that our clumsy kidnapper was indeed a resident of Spotsylvania at the time, which, if you remember, should have made him a prime suspect back then since they were after local sex offenders in that first investigation. However, evidence was never flagged up because he never bothered registering outside of Florida. How is this all the... How is that enough to not be flagged up as a sex offender? Surely the computers should be able to talk to each other and be like, yeah, 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 this guy moved to this other state and he bought a house or registered a house or, you know, he's he's living there now. How is the sex offender registered? And like, oh, is that that guy? They have that, you have um, social security numbers in the US. Everyone's got like a unique identifying number, right? Like, can't you just look that up and be like, let's link it to that guy, he's a sex offender. How hard can it be? Why does he have to register himself? It's absurd.
Thankfully, the requirements are a lot stricter nowadays, but it's crazy to think it was once possible to slip through the cracks because law enforcement was essentially working on the honor system. Yeah, working on the honor system's fine for, like, returning library books. In fact, probably even returning library books doesn't work on the honor system. Registering yourself as a sex offender when you move to another state should not be on the goddamn honor system. And it doesn't even bear to think how much evidence might have gotten away with in the future had it not been for Kara Robinson's escape. She should get that, uh, the, the thing. That the president puts around people's neck and there's that famous meme of barack obama giving it to himself uh, the freedom medal presidential freedom medal something like that she should get this that would be awesome those three murders maybe she does those three murders would have gone on. i don't even know what that's for but i know people get it for doing cool shit. so uh yeah she should get that those three murders would have gone unsolved and who knows how many more oh but now that i remember we haven't actually wrapped up his story yet I know that there are several pages left hop back to june 2002 and this creep is still on the run and in fact he would actually manage to stay a free man just long enough to pull off one last kill How have you not found this guy fbi what are you up to we just talked about how it'd be really fast finding you because we know so much about you and everything come on let's get him evidence's final kill it's 10 p.m. on Thursday, the 27th of June, less than one week after Kara escaped from Evidence's apartment in South Carolina. The killer has managed to fly under the radar for several days, despite the fact that his face is plastered on every TV screen and newspaper in the country. That night, the officers at the Manatee County Sheriff's Office down in Florida received a call from Evidence's own sister. Like the rest of his friends and family, she couldn't believe the news when she heard it. Her own brother was a sexually depraved serial killer. She thought there must have been some kind of mistake until the fugitive called her on his way down to the sunshine, sunshine state where she lived. He cryptically confessed to more crimes than he can remember. Oh my god. <laughs> that is a dark thing to say or hear. Be like, oh my god, brother. <laughs> what? It's like the thing I mentioned earlier about finding out that one of your friends is a serial killer or something. It'd be worse if it's like your family member. It'd be like, oh my god. <laughs> Uh, which certainly suggests a hell of a lot more than the four we have on our tally. His sister, seeing as she wasn't a total scumbag like her big bro, was disgusted and had no problem tipping off the sheriff that evidence was currently parked at an IHOP restaurant off Highway US 41 in Sarasota. He had managed to flee down there by changing the license plate on his silver Ford Escort. Yeah, I mean, of course you're, like, you've just said, you your sister's gonna tell the police no matter how good your relationship is like even if my closest family even if this was my closest family be like no i'm sorry <laughs> like if you were like i robbed a bank i'd be like look i'm not gonna help you because i don't want to be an accessory to your crime but i'm also not gonna tip the police off to where you are i mean allegedly i'm not sure if that's a crime <laughs> it's not no you can't like not tipping the police off isn't a crime but if you've done a crime that i'm like ah oh, you know Okay, it's like we talked about those lines earlier, right? If you've done a crime that falls below the line, like kidnapping and murdering children, I'm going to tip off the police as to where you are and tell, I'd be like, yeah, 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 no, no worries. Why would I tip off the police? And then immediately dial the police. But if it's like another crime that is above the line, I'm, I'm not going to tell the police because <laughs> you're still my family member and I don't want you to go to prison even if you kind of deserve it. Is that bad? I don't feel that's bad. I don't know. I don't know what I'd do. I've never been in that situation because my family aren't criminals. When the sheriff's deputies arrived at the restaurant, they saw Evidence's beat up old car sitting idle in the parking lot, but before they could confirm it was him sitting inside, the engine roared to life and the car screeched towards the main road. The cops were prepared. They had already laid spike traps at the exit, which blew out all four of the kidnapper's tires as he pulled out onto the highway. Even that didn't stop him. He then led a column of police cars on a high speed chase down the west coast of Florida, swaying dangerously as he weaved between the late night traffic at breakneck speed. With his flat tires wearing down to the rims, the cops managed to force Evanitz off the highway and into another restaurant parking lot on the Sarasota Bayfront. His car spun out of control and 15 officers poured out of their squad cars to snatch him. Eminence tried to make a run for it. Oh, dude, just give it up. You're, you're done. You're done. Like, we've seen co uh, police camera action. When you're out of the car and you're on foot, it's game over and the american police have guns but he quickly found himself surrounded back to the wall of the restaurant canine units barking at the end of their leashes our greasy creep had nowhere left to run he pulled out a pistol from his waistband just as the cops released the hounds knowing it would all be over the moment the dogs were on him richard evans placed the muzzle of the gun against the roof of his mouth and pulled the trigger more crimes than he can remember i don't know how to feel about that ending actually it's like you kind of want to be like taking that you know he took the coward's way out 
and well you know he doesn't get the victims don't have their justice of the day in court but i'd also be like good he's dead i'm glad and that you know that sounds like a pretty horrible yeah nah that <laughs> yeah like i said i don't know how i feel about it anyway more crimes than you can remember just like that the man who kidnapped cara robinson with the intention of killing her escaped justice for good he didn't escape justice for good he's dead good in her trademark badass style the girl herself was absolutely furious she told america's most wanted i wanted to go to trial and let him see me again and know i was his downfall i wanted him to look at me and know that choosing me was the biggest mistake he ever made oh cara he knew it like he, he knew it the moment he woke up and you weren't that weren't there to the police chase to him being having his back against that restaurant putting the gun in his mouth he knew it was you you could take comfort in that and yeah no that's great thanks to her daring dash to freedom a vicious serial killer was revealed to and removed from the world after the dust settled on that floridian showdown investigators up in south carolina got to work building a case that would never make it to court definitive proof for the lisk and silver families of what happened to their daughters it proved easy enough in fact they managed to gather an impressive 200 pieces of physical evidence linking him to those cold cases including fibers from his car boot a blanket in his apartment a carpet at his old home in fredericksburg virginia and even more from the fluffy handcuffs which cara slipped out of at the start of her escape it is in forensics is incredible they found evidence in his old house in the carpet of his old house linking him to these crimes from years ago amazing csi or the lab people who ever do this amazing it seemed obvious beyond a doubt that they had finally got the right guy one criminal profile had described him as a sexually sadistic psychopath an analysis of his history revealed a troubled childhood dominated by his alcoholic father oh my god what a surprise the serial killer had a troubled upbringing with abusive parents <laughs> that's not a commonality on casual criminalists at all don't abuse your children and a culture of infidelity in his parents marriage which often saw young richard passing messages to his father's mistresses or do that don't do that to your kids either that's a recipe for screwing them up and when the psychological profilers got to work on him they drew attention to the fact that both of his ex-wives were much younger than him when he was 25 he married a 17 year old friend of his little sister Is that legal and his widow hope evanitz was also 17 when he married her at the age of 36. I mean I thought that wasn't allowed in America I thought 18 was when that could go down this explains why he had several periods of inactivity in his criminal career his widow admitted that Evanitz was a fan of certain niche bedroom activities regarding age role play and consent dude get on a list some people believe the blank spots in his rap sheet could be explained by the fact that his wives were still young enough to fulfill his secret desires it's worth noting here that even after everything came out Evanitz's widow hope still stood by him saying he was my husband he still is my husband and i love him dearly oh what are you up to <laughs> why that is so crazy he's a serial killing child rapist why are you up to i still love him dearly you shouldn't you really shouldn't sorry love but this man kidnapped children and abused them in your marital bed it's great to say you stand by your man and all that but surely there has to be some limits yes we talked we've talked about the line many times in this episode and this guy is so far beyond the line what's your name i don't even know i don't care anyway since the killer was too cowardly to face the music and confess to the rest of his crimes the cops were left trudging through his murky past to see if any other cold cases matched up to his whereabouts throughout the years sheriff lon lot of richland county south carolina says we're going to do his whole life's tale we'll take it from the time he was born and go forward it's going to be quite extensive that meant enlisting the help of the FBI to investigate the suspect stints in Florida, California, Texas, and Virginia, not to mention all of the places he must have gone while enlisted with the Navy. Wow, this is going to be a big investigation. Unfortunately, his official tally only features four confirmed cases to date. However, the task force did manage to unearth a few possible connections dating back to the mid-90s. Most intriguing of all, in Evanitz's footlocker of soul souvenirs and scraps, he kept one key he kept one piece of paper which he scribbled the words 29 North germana road the first part refers to us highway 29 and the second to a state road in virginia it was a set of directions but to where well charting the killer's path along those directions officers arrived at the site of another grim discovery back in may 1996. it was the body 
of Alicia Showalter Reynolds, who disappeared while driving from Baltimore to Charlottesville down Highway 29. Several witnesses reported driving past the 25-year-old while she was parked on the side of the highway, receiving assistance from an early middle-aged white man. Chillingly, several other women said they also had been targeted along that stretch of road by this same man. He would flag them down through the window to tell them something was wrong with their car. Could this have been evidence scouting the area and practicing his routine for the eventual murder? Of this young woman. It's never been confirmed, and Reynolds's case is still open. However, when a known serial killer's stalking notes lead directly to the dumping ground of a body, it would be a crazy coincidence if it wasn't connected. Yes, of course it would. What else? It's just a road in the middle of nowhere where there's a body and it was written down by a serial killer? It's him. 100%. I mean, maybe not enough in court, but it doesn't matter because he's dead and also he killed four people, so he'd be in prison forever anyway. And this is only one of the crimes evidence was connected with among several other rapes and kidnappings throughout the mid 90s. Unfortunately, almost 20 years after the monster was unmasked and with no further progress, it's unlikely that any of those will ever be brought to a satisfactory close. Wrap up. The road to recovery. But that's far too dismal a note to end on. So instead, let's take a last look at the real main character. There's a reason we never gave Evidence the title of the episode after all. I promised you something like a happy ending, and the story of Carl Robinson's recovery is about as positive as you could hope after such a horrific experience. Did she get the Presidential Freedom Medal? Oh, come on! I mean, Richard Evidence thought he had it all laid out right up until the point when he would dump the poor girl's body in a stream somewhere and move on with his life, welcoming his mum and wife back from Disneyland, but instead he ended up dead on the floor of a Florida parking lot while the young life he tried to cut short went on. Hell yeah! Cara received the $150,000 reward for her part in solving the Lisk Sylvia case, but she got more out of it than that. Quote, Following my escape, I was able to go to Virginia and meet with the families of the three girls, and that meant so much to me. Cara, you sound like an absolutely great human being. After getting a taste of, life, of a life-fighting crime a little more hands-on than most of us ever will, she then went on to enroll at the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy for, for a career in victim services and sex crime investigation. Legend. Eight years after that terrifying ordeal at the center of the episode, she had turned her trauma into something positive, graduated from the academy and became and began a career helping others. Another ten years later, and she's nowadays married and caring for her own two kids. This is awesome. I'm so happy about the ending of this one. Despite I mean, I know other people died, but like to just to take away this super positive part, mwah. Despite leaving law enforcement behind when she started a family, Kara now helps the survivors of the world through an unlikely medium, TikTok. No, it's not just for stupid synchronized dancers, really. With 220,000 followers, good lord and counting, she dispenses advice on recovering from trauma, general self-help, and practical trip tips on how to avoid and escape the Richard Evidences of this world. And I think it's worth noting that her message, and by extension ours today, is that surviving isn't just about badass getaway stories. In reality, it's not always possible to escape whatever tough situations life throws at you outright. Surviving trauma is just as much about healing and making something positive out of situations which might have once seemed helpless. We've got, I really hope we got a plug for, uh, in fact, I'll just plug it now because I see it. At Kara Robinson, spelt the typical way, Chamberlain. C-H-A-M-B-E-R-L-A-I-N. And I'll mention it again in a second. Cool. If you don't have TikTok, it's quite fun. Uh, I actually have a TikTok for this casual criminalist where we put the little highlights of the show up on it. I have like a thousand followers. <laughs> I'm not Kara Robinson's TikTok game yet. 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 <laughs> Now that's the kind of uplifting note we can end on. A young woman who survived a serial killer and went on to make the world a better place for all. See, not everything has to be death, disaster, and misery. Anyway, join us next time on The Casual Criminals for our regularly scheduled program of death, disaster, and depending on my mood, perhaps a light touch of misery. <laughs> yeah, of course it will be. This one's been nice. I mean, I keep saying it, apart from all the murder. Dismembered Appendices Number one. If you're worried about the possibility of getting kidnapped yourself, maybe you'll want to check out the TikTok page of Cara Robinson for yourself at Cara Robinson Chamberlain. She shares useful tips like how to escape from zip ties alongside newspaper clippings from her case, and general advice on how to support someone who's been through something tough. Alternatively, just do what I do and scream and shout at every car that passes by your house just to be safe. <laughs> Number two. One thing that caught the eye of profilers in this case is how Evanet seemed to have an affinity for water. For example, it appears as if he routinely disposed of his victims in water, and drowning appears to be the cause of death in at least two-thirds of his confirmed murders. It may all be linked to one traumatic childhood incident in which his own father allegedly simulated drowning him in a bathtub or a pool, depending on the version, as punishment for splashing the burgers at a family barbecue. Ah, yes. 
And once again, we're finding out that the 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 bad person in today's episode was uh, had had sh parents. Yeah. Number three, few would envy Kara for her ordeal, but it did give her a bit of a head start at the police academy. In fact, while she was studying there, her instructor actually presented a case study about a South Carolina girl who faced off with a serial killer and lived to tell the tale. Until the end of the lesson, her classmates had no idea that they were that the person they were studying was actually sitting right next to them. That'd be f***ing epic, being in that class and being like, yo, 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 excuse me, sorry, don't mean to interrupt. That's me, yes? That's goddamn right. Uh, this has been an episode of the Casual Criminalist. Thank you so much for listening uh, or watching however you consume this show. If you liked it, please leave a review, uh, a podcast review. That would be amazing. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you've smashed that like button and I'll see you next time.